So what fun to be here. Uh, and I want to thank Kyle and Melissa and everyone for the opportunity to speak. And actually, since I'm a local boy from, uh, I live in downtown Chicago in Keechan, UIC, and I have to drive out to the Verbs on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays to get to Argonne National Lab. So I'm very familiar with the area. And I do think that local action and interest is really what's driving uh, the climate change movement. So it's great to see you all here and everybody's so uh, fired up. Uh, especially, on, I don't know, I'll call this the first day of winter. On, uh, <laughs> when I drove here, I was expecting traffic jams and I didn't find any, which might be because it's Veterans Day, but um, it was 22 degrees and uh, very clearly winter. Yeah. So I wanna talk about deep decarbonization. Um, I'm gonna start by uh, giving some overview uh, where we are in understanding, let's say, climate change and its causes. So I think we all know what the cause is. Uh, and then a little bit about how to address it. And I think it's very early on in addressing decarbonization. So there are lots of things that you can think of doing, some of which you can do yourself, like buy an electric vehicle and lots of other things that would just be personal decisions of yours. Uh, but to really get after it, we have to have societal action. So it's not going to happen with everybody's volunteering. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about that. I want to be clear that we don't know how to decarbonize uh, 100% or even 80%, but we do know how to you know, start the process. And where the problems are, I want to... Uh, spend a little more time on because that's going to require some R&D. So there are discoveries that still have to be made in order to decarbonize. Uh, so that's the, uh, that's the general outline. This little thing here I just noticed when I was sitting there that uh, through the magic of PowerPoint, this five should be up there and then zero off there and so on. So you'll be able to read the scales very easily, but it doesn't matter. That's the global carbon emissions industry. It's going up top top. And it right, is the main point of that slide. I'll have a little bit more to say about that later. So let's go to the next slide. Here we are. And here you see two things. The big thing on the left is the global temperature and carbon dioxide compared from 1880 to 2016. And you can see that they pretty much follow each other. And you might guess that there was a correlation there. You might read into that there was a cause and effect there which would be a little too much until you do the homework. But on the right-hand side, you see Spot de Arrhenius, which every scientist will recognize his name from the Arrhenius plot and various other things. A Swede who in 1896 said, CO2 causes global warming. And sometimes this is referred to, tongue in cheek, cutting edge 19th century science. So maybe we should know it by now. <laughs> Uh, but he was the first one to point that out. Uh, and uh, if you, here's our same graph. Oh, and here, in fact, the, the numbers uh, work out. This is global fossil CO2 emissions from 1990 till about now. And you see a couple of very interesting things about this graph. First of all, uh, it's going up rather slowly here around 1990, and there's a number of 1% per year. Then it reaches a pretty steep slope in uh, the mid-2000s, 3% a year. And for three years in a row, which would have been 2014 to 2016, it looked like it was pretty flat. And everyone hoped that indeed this was going to be the peak and it would turn down, that maybe we were over the worst of it. Well, that did not turn out to be the case. The last two years, that is 17 and 18, it actually went up. And although it's only two data points, this, the, the, the uh, increase of the slope looks pretty high. The slope is something like 2.7%, which is close to the maximum it's ever gone up since 1990. So we are going the wrong direction. And this is something that we need to look at. And of course, we very eagerly awaiting what the 2019 number will be. And without speculating, let's wait for it. Uh, there's other evidence of climate change. This is extreme weather. So 
2018 <laughs> billion dollar disasters in context. So this is 19, uh, 80, yeah, 1980, and this is 2018. And on the right, you see the cost of severe weather in billions of dollars. On the left, you see the number of events. And it's very clear that it's going up with time. Uh, very good reason for that, qualitatively, it's because the atmosphere is warmer. And that means there's more heat to drive more violent storms. Uh, the tropical oceans are warmer, and that means there's more heat in the water to drive hurricanes, so they can be more extreme. Interestingly, they can develop a lot faster now. In the last two or three years, and especially this year, we've seen hurricanes that in a matter of hours or a day have gone from basically tropical storms to, you know, uh, level three or level four hurricanes. But there's an unmistakable trend up. So that is a sign of climate change. So you can ask, uh, what is the uh, relationship between emissions from fossil fuels and land use change? So it's gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. And uh, rising temperatures. So this is taken from a whole lot of computer models. And of course, computer models might be wrong, they're modeling the future, but the consensus is remarkable. Uh, so there, the more emissions, the more warming. So you see on the right-hand side, less than two degrees warming is here. Here's less than three degrees warming, less than four, less than five, and less than six. And the more emissions we, in, we give out in the future, the higher the temperature is going to be. So uh, we are on a curve that is not, well, something interesting about this curve. If you want to uh, stay below, let's say, two degrees, that sometime around 2050 or so, you have to go negative. That means that you have to actually take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That is a technology we don't have yet. We have no idea. Well, we have some ideas how to do it. In fact, you can do it, but it's pretty expensive and pretty, pretty clunky. Uh, but that's the magnitude of the challenge. And you see that if we never get there, if we never take any, uh, any carbon dioxide out, we're doomed to be certainly above three degrees. So that's a lot of warning. Uh, and, um, that's a challenge. That's a technological challenge. So let's ask the question, what does that degree of warming mean? What does three degrees or four degrees of warming mean? Go back to the uh, maximum of the last ice age. That was about 18,000 years ago. Uh, and uh, you see that this is what the Earth looked like. It was basically extreme desert. That's everything in this color or closed canopy forest, and there are a few places where you find closed canopy forest, but not too many, or it's glacial ice. And this is what four and a half degrees warming looked like. So we went from here to whatever the climate is today. Yeah. We say two degrees, where is the two degrees being measured? In the ocean on a specific point in the so, I, so yeah, I think it's the average of the air. But that's a very good question. Of course, over the Earth's surface, you know, there's lots of places you could measure it. So there might be some uncertainty in that number, but it's basically the outs here. Uh, so uh, that was pretty serious. So sea level rise from that time was 120 meters. And that's with four and a half degrees of warming. So if you had two degrees of warming or three degrees or four degrees, it's going to be pretty serious. Uh, here are some recent climate change reports, three of them, from just before 2015. This was the one that set the stage for the Paris Conference, COP21, as it's called, uh, in uh, November 2015. Then in 2018, October, comes out uh, another IPCC uh, report talking about warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, not 2 degrees, but 1.5 and what that would mean. And just a month later, the US Global Change Research Program issued its fourth national climate assessment. 
this is congressionally mandated. Uh, and we learned that the climate is changing faster than we expected. So especially these two last reports amplified and accelerated the uh, rate that was reported in 2015. So 2015 was kind of a turning point. That is when everybody kind of woke up and said, oh, uh, we're going to have to decarbonize 100%, not just mostly or not just start, but we're going to have that actually go all the way. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. There are some possible tipping points. So all of this is predicting the future. And the only thing you know about predictions of the future, they're definitely wrong. It will do something else. It may not be very different, but you won't get it all right. Uh, but there are some tipping points. So first one, collapse of major ice sheets in Greenland and Antarctica. Uh, and this would do a couple of things. So ice is white. It reflects the sunlight and keeps the, the ice cap uh, cold. It doesn't take the extra heat in from the sun to get reflected. But that would be replaced by dark water, which would absorb that uh, solar energy and warm. And that would be runaway. So it's positive feedback. So the more you melt, the hotter you get. The more you melt, the hotter you get. Uh, so it, uh, it would be a dramatic change in the sea level in ocean circulation. So that's one possible tipping point not included in those, uh, those predictions. A second one would be uh, disruption of the th what's called the thermohaline uh, circulation. So that's a picture here on uh, the lower. And you're all familiar with this, the so-called Gulf Stream, which comes up South America, the top of South America goes past Florida, goes over to Europe, that's why Europe is a lot warmer than it should be because the Gulf Stream keeps it warm. Then somewhere up near Greenland, it dives down. It's a surface current at that point. It dives down and does a pretty circuitous path around the Antarctic, deep in the uh, ocean, and then comes back up uh, over here in the Pacific and retraces its path. So that's responsible for a lot of the temperature you know, local climates that we have on the, in, on the earth. Uh, there is the day that's driven by the difference in temperature between the North Pole and the equator. That difference is decreasing because that's what global warming does. The Arctic is warming much faster than the rest of the earth. And so there is a danger that that could stop this uh, thermal heat circulation. This uh, circuit the water takes about a thousand years to complete one circuit. So it's a very, but if that were to slow down or stop, it would dramatically affect global warming. Uh, there's another possible tipping point, sudden release of methane from Arctic permafrost, which permafrost is any part of the ground that's uh, frozen for two years in a row. Uh, but as the Arctic warms, that permafrost melts, it lets the methane that's trapped there out. And of course, methane is a very potent greenhouse gas, especially in the short term. Uh, and that, of course, would be runaway, right? The hotter it gets, the more it's released. So that would be a tipping point. And finally, the ocean uptake of carbon. So acidification. So wh what does carbon dioxide do? It dissolves in the surface ocean, the shallow ocean. That creates carbonic acid. It acidifies uh, the oceans, and that kills the photosynthesizing plankton, <coughs> the ones that in fact remove CO2 from the air. So shells of marine organisms might begin to dissolve, releasing carbon back into the environment. That would be a novativity. So all of these are things that haven't been included in the, uh, in the predictions. So how fast are we decarbonized? So let's say we got the message that we should decarbonize. This is where we are from 1990 to the present, 2017. And you see there are many sources of greenhouse gases. Transportation, 29%, is now the biggest one. Until last year, the biggest one was electricity generation from coal and natural gas. Uh, but because... Uh, we, that has come down quite a bit. Now transportation is the king. 
Then, of course, electricity generation. The third one there is industry that has two pieces to it. We use fossil fuels for feedstocks to make plastics and other high value chemicals. And uh, industry needs high temperatures, higher temperatures than you can get from electricity. You have to have combustion of something. And that combustion used to be coal, now it's mostly natural gas, but they simply need that to produce temperatures above 1,000 degrees, which you cannot do with electricity. So uh, that's where that comes from. Then there's agriculture, surprising perhaps, if you hadn't thought about this, it'd be 9% of carbon emissions. That's actually a lot, and you do have to deal with that. And then comes buildings. So these are commercial buildings and residential buildings. And that's just from heat. So that's where we are. And here's where we have to get to. So on the scales, there's 2015, but we have to be carbon free by 2050. We're not doing so well. So that's, that's a challenge. Um, here are every year since 1992, uh, how much have we decarbonized? So this means that you see a dotted line there. There's something around 2% in 1994. That means we decarbonized 2%. So we went down in emissions by 2%. In some years, the red years, we actually went up. Uh, and uh, the average is there is that dotted line. So it's, it's uh, we're doing something but we're not doing enough. So this is US, this is not the world. What I was showing you on the first slide was in fact for the, for the entire world. So we got a long ways to go. Uh, and this is interesting, it's come out, this is the New York Times last week. So uh, climate change is accelerating. Here are the predictions for in 2100, what will be sea level rise? and it's cataloged from 1990 for each year, each set of years. So in 1990, there was only one estimate that was the IPCC and the mid-range was 66 centimeters and uh, uh, the worst case was 110. So that's sea level rise in 2100. And then in 95, uh, it was thought to uh, not be quite so dangerous, not so, not so strong. 2001, a little bit lower, and even as recently as 07, it looked like, well, maybe it's not as bad as we thought. But in uh, 12, 13, and 17, you see new estimates. Some of these came from NOAA, but IPCC is still in there, and they went up. In fact, they went up dramatically, so the latest thing in 2017, um, 8.2 uh, meters, I think, did I read that right? Yeah. Uh, sorry, 8.2 feet. Uh, so that's uh, way bigger than it was. So we're finding as we look more carefully that in fact the problem's worse than we thought. Uh, here's another report in the Washington Post, which was just last month. Uh, scientists have now tripled the estimate of the number of people who live, will live below the high tide line in 2100. So it was thought to be not so bad, uh, but of course sea level now is uh, thought to rise much much more than it was in uh, by 20 like average, and three times as many people will live below the high tide line. So that's a real challenge. This is just a dramatic picture of, of, of flux, I think, in New York City. Public awareness of climate change. How many people really understand what's going on? So this is, uh, poll that was taken uh, very recently, 20, I think you can read that probably better than I can, 24% believe that half of climate scientists or fewer think that human-caused global warming is half. Well, you, I'm sure you all know that it's accepted climate science that it's definitely half. Hey, there is, no, it's, it's, it's not even half. 36 believes that between 51 and 90% of scientists think that global warming is happening. 17% uh, correctly understand that almost all climate scientists think that global warming is happening. Pretty small number. And 25% don't know. So there's not even 
uh, sufficient public acceptance of, of climate science to uh, to get the momentum going to address it. Is that U.S. or that is U.S. Any idea what Europe would be? I don't. That's a good question. And actually, the Washington. Uh, let's see, where did that come from? I don't have the reference. I can look it up. I can set it. Well, it seems like we're a lot more ignorant. This country. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> we'll, we'll also be providing this uh, uh, presentation out uh, on our website afterwards. So if you're taking notes, then uh, I will provide a link to it. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, this is published on it. So anybody who wants to does not want it. So over here, uh, increased support for prioritizing, uh, prioritizing policies on the environment climate change since 2011. So this goes from 2008 to about 2018. The number who uh, would like to see, this is U.S. adults, uh, that uh, one of these should be a top priority, either protecting the environment or dealing with global climate change. And you see it is going up. So there is a positive uh, sense of public awareness there. And my own sense of what the public thinks is that recently it's got up much more partly because of what's happened in Europe, partly because millennials and with younger generation, even teenagers like Greta Thunberg are uh, speaking up and getting a lot of attention. Here's another uh, sort of poll. A majority of U.S. adults say that climate size affects their local area. 31 say it affects them personally. So we are, I think, and I believe that one of the reasons is extreme weather. It's pretty hard to uh, ignore extreme weather that happens to you every day, uh, and you notice it, and, uh, and that seems to be a convincing. So there's what, uh, where we are. Here's the plot I was showing you before, uh, and the question is, can we achieve 100% decarbonization by 2050? Well, it was really the Paris climate uh, conference in 2015 that was the turning point. So after Paris, the focus was on 100% and even taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere beyond 2050. Uh, that began to catch people's attention. So for example, uh, natural gas turbines have a 40 year life. So if you put them in now, what's called this 2020, they're gonna last until 2060 and they're certainly, you're certainly not going to 100% uh, decarbonize by 2030. So you can look at electric vehicles, they're transforming transportation. This becomes thinkable, really, since 2015, we begin to think about that much more seriously. Uh, and it looks like there may be a way to get there, uh, at least for transportation. But the conversation shifted. It shifted from getting the first 50% to getting the last 50%. And it's pretty hard to decarbonize uh, long haul trucking or transatlantic uh, flight uh, and sea transportation just because they require a lot of energy. You're not gonna do that with electricity. And what about space and water heating? What about the industrial processes that use combustion of fossil fuel for heat? Do we have the technology or do we need new technology? This is a question maybe. So, Let's take a look at electric vehicles. Uh, they certainly have the potential to decarbonize transportation, provided it's a 100% deployment, right? Uh, and I'm gonna make a provocative statement that the reason you guys did not buy an electric vehicle last year is all the battery. So for example, you'd like to have, why, why is it not as good as a, as a gasoline car? Well, the range isn't quite the same. It's, should be 400 miles, not 250. Should have faster charging time, minutes, not hours. Should be a lower purchase price. I think they'd have to sell for 20K because that's the only way you're gonna capture the mass market. But the uh, price, lowest price you could get what now from GM or Tesla is 35K and most people pay about 50 because they want a little better car. Should be a longer battery lifetime. Lithium ion batteries are guaranteed for eight years, but cars are 16. You might have to replace your battery in the life of a car, that would be expensive. Safety is a big problem. So if uh, it's a thing with lithium ion batteries, if they happen to get above 150 degrees centigrade, 
it triggers what's called a thermal runaway reaction. It's a reaction between the cathode and the electrolyte in the battery. It has nothing to do with the oxygen in the air. That releases heat, that makes the battery warmer, that makes the reaction so faster. It looks like the battery burst into flames. Uh, if your cell phone, so I carry my cell phone in my pocket. If I notice it getting warm, I can throw it over there on the floor, and if it bursts into flames, it might scorch the rug. But that's probably the worst, uh, you know, worst hazard that to, uh, not really a, a personal hazard. Not true with an EVs. So if you're in an EV and you're in a crash, you can't get out. You're actually sitting on the battery. The way that EVs are made now, they, uh, right on the chassis, the battery fills all the floor space and they put the passenger cabin and the seats on top of the battery. So safety being helps really, really work. We should recycle, we don't. Uh, and there should be less sensor, less uh, temperature sensitive. So if you live in the middle of Min Minneapolis in the middle of winter, you might get 40% less range on your, on your EV. That doesn't happen with the electric car. So all of these things, if you noticed, are challenges of the battery. So if we could make the battery a lot better, so it was more appealing and cheaper than a gasoline car, it would become a no brainer. You wouldn't have to say the word climate change and just for economic reasons, it this wouldn't have the potential to decarbonize transportation. So other things about uh, batteries, the gasoline engine is really complicated, pistons going up and down, valves opening and closing, sparks going off, uh, lots of moving parts. The electric motor only has one moving part, that's the spindle, everything else is stationary, and therefore it has a far lower maintenance cost. So once you buy the expensive car, you don't have to pay as much uh, to maintain it. It also it has a much higher efficiency. So electric motors are 90%, 95% efficient, whereas gasoline engines, even at their best, are something like 25% efficient. So you're gonna get a lot more out of the, out of the fuel that you make, but they really need that's electricity. And there's a lower fuel cost. So it costs you about twice as much to drive a mile on gasoline as it does to drive a mile on electricity. That's true almost no matter where you are in the US. So uh, what this says is that EVs probably already are the economic choice for high mileage vehicles like taxis or fleet vehicles. It's actually cheaper to have an EV than a gasoline car. And here's some data that backs that up. This is from New York City, um, their uh, car fleet. Uh, the maintenance cost for 2018 last year, and you see there's some uh, conventional gasoline cars, Focus and Fusion, and at the bottom are a couple of electric cars, the Leaf and the Bolt, and the maintenance cost last year was far less for the electric vehicles than it was for the gas. So what does that mean? Well, it probably means that uh, what well, definitely means that the high battery cost, that's a barrier to entry, but it's a benefit for high mileage cars and fleets like the New York City fleet, uh, the Chicago fleet, should convert to electric vehicles. This would just makes economic sense. Uh, and uh, you may have noticed a couple of weeks ago, Amazon uh, announced that they just ordered 100,000 electric delivery vehicles from Rivian, a startup, uh, to be delivered 2021 to 2024. This is a big deal, by far the biggest purchase of electric vehicles ever announced. And since it's fleet use at Amazon, they will do something sensible about charging those cars from the grid. Uh, and that will be a model for how maybe the rest of us can learn to manage to charge our cars uh, in, a, in a sensible way. So this is happening. Uh, but there's more than just EVs. There's bigger, uh, bigger vehicles out there, namely city buses or long distance buses and long distance street trucks, which you see pictures of there. And here are the emissions from heavy trucks, medium trucks, and buses. Most of it you see comes from trucks. Uh, and uh, could you electrify that? Well, um, maybe. Tesla is talking about it, and there are other companies that have already brought out electric trucks. Uh, and um, the cost has come down. So in 2013, it was about $500 per kilowatt hour. That should be a slash. 
It's come down to about two hundred dollars a kilowatt hour in twenty nineteen, so that's a big deal. It's a lot cheaper. However, electric trucks, because of the battery, are heavier than diesel trucks, and the energy density of the lithium ion batteries is much, much less than that of diesel fuel. That means you have to recharge pretty often uh, as you go across country, and that means delays. So there are some challenges here. And this, the, the heavy, the buses and trucks have not taken off yet the way EVs have. You may know that CTA has 2,000 diesel buses they run every day. They have two electric buses. They run along Grand Avenue between Navy Pier and somewhere out west uh, that they're testing. And their plan is to replace all 2,000 by 2040 with electric buses. So this would be a step in the right direction. Um, but how about fuel cell trucks? So you don't have to run an electric truck off of a battery, you could run it off a hydrogen fuel cell. So this is a little diagram of the hydrogen fuel cell. What happens is hydrogen comes in at the left. Uh, it, uh, an electron is taken off of the hydrogen. It's a highly hydrogen molecule. First it splits into hydrogen atoms. Then an electron is taken off each atom. Those two electrons go through the external circuit and drive the motor. So this looks a little bit like a battery in that sense. And on the other side, the, head, the hydrogen combines with oxygen, maybe from the air, to make water. So there are no carbon emissions in this hydrogen fuel cell. And uh, this technology has been around for a long time, 20 years, more than 20 years, getting better all the time, uh, has not taken off yet the way batteries have because it's harder to store the hydrogen and uh, various technical reasons the cost is too high. But you could imagine that as the cost became lower, that you could power a truck like that with a hydrogen fuel cell. And the weight would go down. These things are not as heavy as batteries. Uh, you'd have very fast refueling. It's just put the hydrogen gas into the tank. 50 to 60% efficiency, that's pretty good, but not as good as a lithium ion battery, which is more like 85%. No emissions and the problems, I didn't put here, the problem actually is to lower the cost. So that's the challenge. That's the technological challenge. Would these also have the combustion threat that the electric vehicles had? Would these also have the com combustion threats that the electrical vehicles The combustion threat, like you said, the, the battery. Overheating. Safety. Oh, no, that, that does not happen here. So there is no thermal runaway reaction with, uh, with fuel cells. So it's safer? It, it, they're actually pretty safe. Uh, of course, you have hydrogen around that could catch on fire, but I mean, uh, as from the fuel cell itself, no, there's no particular safety issue. Good question. Yeah. Um, but is it true that for hydrogen fuel, like when you refuel, like, yeah, it is faster, but then after the first vehicle, we maybe some time in between to actually be built. Faster on the first round? Uh, like, you can, you can. Refill on the first go. Yeah. And the next vehicle that's on my, so there's a wait period. Of it. So you can't just rebuild right come behind me. Assuming you only have one refill a station. So okay. I'm not familiar with that. That could well be true, but that sounds like a soluble problem. I mean, maybe you just have many green jail stations. Do you have a similar problem with actually electric vehicles charging batteries? It takes a lot of electricity. So unless you're hooked up to a pretty power source, you may have to wait and if you have a solar analysis and generate more like this, but that's a rigor. So what would the efficiency of these be compared to the electric? Sorry? The efficiency of these compared to the electric, or would they use the same motor? You would use the same electric motor, identically the same, no difference. Would they have the same efficiency? So, well, this has 50 to 60% efficiency, that means 50 to 60% of the chemical energy in the hydrogen appears as electricity. And with the lithium ion battery, of course, you're charging it with electricity and you get 85 to 90% of that electricity back when you discharge. So the battery has a higher efficiency than this does. And that's one of the challenges. For that reason, not quite as efficient, would cost you more than if it were as efficient as, as a battery. But it is safe, right? It is safe. It is safer. There's no thermal runway. Absolutely. And also the cost of hydrogen stations are submitted higher in, in air to charge. 
I've yeah, estimates of two million dollars per station. And it was a charging stations, you know, high recording of other house. You would ten of those you know, charge on I would get the cars. Yeah, true. And you do have to worry about where you get the hydrogen. Uh, but yes, I don't have it here. But most of the, I have it later. Most of the hydrogen comes from reforming methane, and that produces carbon dioxide just as if you burn the methane. So you have to get it in order to decarbonize. You have to get it from splitting water. We'll go into that in a minute. But that that's another issue. So there are. It's not a. It's not a, a done deal. What about electric flight? So uh, that may seem like a fantasy, but actually it isn't. Uh, and I'll show you two ways to get to all electric flight. One is to scale up a prototype like this. This is something that Boeing is working on. It's an air taxi. So commute you from the verge to your job in the city and that comment, I just, uh, it, it's vertical takeoff and landing because you don't want to mess with runways that takes up too much space. Uh, this is a thing they tested in January of this year. I think it was designed for um, uh, for four passengers with no pilot, though it's autonomous. Uh, and they tested in January. Here was the test. It was sitting on the tarmac. They raised it up five meters, held it there for 60 seconds, and then let it come back down. So that doesn't sound like much of a test. <laughs> But let me remind you that in 1903, the Wright brothers managed to get heavier than their flight for 12 seconds. <laughs> and that really changed the world. Within a decade, there were stunt pilots flying under bridges and the first scheduled airline appeared, actually in 1914. So this could be momentous. Could support, so. The Wright Brothers play on no, this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look at it. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Usually, you need more energy to get up and down. That's the hard thing. Yeah, it's hard. So, it takes about twice as much energy to raise it up as it does to go for the system. Although, indeed, they did test the hard. Yeah. Uh, there's another way to get up. So, you could scale that up to bigger size. The other way is to elect electrify an existing full size plate. And this is what Airbus is working on. Uh, and they, uh, the idea is it's got four jet engines. Take off one of the jet engines and put a propeller to battery off. And they're kidding, so it's a hybrid. And there could be advantages to that. If you wanted to run the airport later at night or earlier in the morning, you would take off and land on the battery because it's quiet. Uh, if you were concerned about carbon emissions, you would adjust your flight plan to run off the battery or off the jet fuel to produce minimum carbon emissions. If, if you are worried about economics, uh, you might just want to make it cheap, so you would adjust your flight plan between battery and jet fuel to save money. So there's a lot of flexibility here. I think uh, since these planes fly in sunshine, 30, 40,000 feet, could you uh, cover them with solar panels, supplement the yeah. electricity that you've already stored in the battery? You can, and people have made all solar flights. It turns out you need an awful lot of space, uh, solar town space, to get enough energy to really live. So while it's practical for one pilot in a very light plane, it's really not practical for a, a heavy transport like this. But not, not as the sole source, but would it add significantly to the um, you know, amount of electricity that would be available? So, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good question. What is the quantitative difference? Yeah. And you can also do interesting things like when you're landing, regenerative, you wouldn't call it braking, or did you would, but you're getting energy because you're falling downhill. As when you're flying, if you lose altitude, you can also regenerate. But yes. Look at what you're saying. Yeah. Yes. Well, that, not just landing, right? It's just, just any time that any time you go down. Right. Yeah, right. absolutely. For sure. So there are advantages to this. And actually, I, I personally think it's a pretty good idea. It, and there are people who say it's going to be cheaper, again, because electricity is cheaper than jet fuel. So this, this, this has, uh, I don't know, has uh, potential. Airbus is working on it. Uh, here's another one. 
So in Paris, in June of this year, they had the Paris Air Show. It was at uh, Le Bourguet, I suppose, in French. Uh, airfield, that's the old Paris airport where Charles Lindbergh landed in 1927. And here's a plane that was on display. It's a nine passenger battery powered plane. Uh, it can go 650 miles. It uh, runs at 275 miles an hour. It's supposed to fly at 10,000 feet, but it could fly higher at 30,000 if it has to. It's powered by a 900 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery pack. And for comparison, the, the big Teslas have a 100 kilowatt hour battery pack. So this is nine times as much. Uh, and if you look closely, you see it has propellers on the tail and on the wingtips. Um, according to the newspapers, uh, at least 10 of these airplanes were bought by a little airline called uh, Cape Air that operates in Massachusetts for short hop coastal flights. So this is already here. Uh, and it's a sign in the middle that says all of these things. If you talk to the manufacturers, Boeing, Airbus, and Eviation, which makes that little nine passenger plane, they expect to deploy uh, before 2025. So this couldn't happen. Um, how about the grid? So that's transportation. How about the grid? Uh, so here's the grid. It's generation, it's transmission, it's distribution and use to customers. What are the, I'm going to call them mega trends that are going to control what the grid looks like over between now and 25th, so the next 30 years? Well, one of them is renewable wind and solar. And certainly we're getting a lot of renewable wind and solar on the grid, partly because it's getting cheaper and starting to compete with say natural gas. So and in some states like Nevada and Arizona, combining uh, solar plus storage, power purchase agreements have been let at less than three cents a kilowatt hour. That's way cheaper than anything else you can do in those states. So it's starting to become economically really attractive. Second thing is energy storage. We're putting big batteries on the, on, on the grid now, and we were not doing that before, say, 2017. So that's just the last two or three years. And what we're finding is they work. There's no glitches. So the battery sizes are getting bigger, not anywhere near as big as they need to get, but uh, it's certainly going in the right direction. We have to decarbonize. So that's one of the drivers. We're getting electric cars. They have to be charged from some place, they, and that's the grid. So that's going to be a big impact on the grid. And the last one, the distribution system is changing dramatically. So instead of just delivering power from the power station to the customer, one might flow. There's rooftop solar. There are electric vehicles in your driveway. Uh, and there are batteries that you may want to put in your house to help you manage the rooftop solar or simply to cut your demand peak. So it's going to change dramatically. Uh, so those are the mega trends. And if you analyze those mega trends, you could ask this question, what will the grid look like in 2050? Uh, and what would you like to achieve? So don't just extrapolate what you think might possibly happen, but start with a clean sheet of paper that say, here's what I think should happen. Uh, and I put five things here. Well, decarbonization is maybe the top one. Should we get to 100% or some other number? What our target should be? Reliability is really important. And if you compare European reliability with United States reliability, it's quite different. So the average customer in the United States experiences 214 minutes of outage in a year. Uh, in Europe, it's more like 50, so very different. In Germany, it's 18 minutes, almost half a year. And that's a difference in, in the way the grids operate. There's resilience. So suppose the power does go, up, go off, how fast can it get it back on? We haven't really thought about that deeply enough. Uh, in fact, we don't even know whether time or cost is more important. Uh, and then there's cybersecurity, and we're getting a lot more uh, interest in that. Uh, what if an enemy takes out our grid and then does something uh, 
even more serious to us. And then there's cost. And again, the U.S. and, the, and Europe are very different. It's about 12 cents a kilowatt hour here. It's about twice that. So we'd have to think about what do we want for the grid in 2050? And once we thought about it, we should ask this question, can we achieve the outcomes with the present technology? If the answer is yes, then we ought to be using policy and regulation and above all innovative business plans to get that technology out there. If the answer is no, then we ought to ask where are the gaps? What do we need? And we ought to be assigning R&D funding to address those difficulties. So it's a very concrete uh, strategic plan if we can carry it out. Here's what electric cars are likely to do to the grid. So this study came out last spring from NREL, National Renewable Energy Lab. It's electricity consumption since 1950 till now. And what could happen going forward if there's almost a low deployment, that's the reference case of electric vehicles, if there's a medium or a high deployment. And you see medium and high is 20% to 38% more uh, demand in electricity. That's pretty remarkable. If you look uh, at just the last 20 years since the year 2000, demand has been pretty flat. So the utilities have not had to produce any more electricity than they did 20 years ago. The reason is we've gotten much more efficient, LED bulbs and lots of other things. So we actually produce more work, more output, but with the same amount of electricity. That's gonna change. So the utilities will see a bigger income stream and they, what will they do with that money? Well, they could uh, upgrade the grid to deal with the new demand. So how would you do that? I got some animation here that I'm just gonna click through and you could read that if you like. But let me tell you, how would you deal with this extra demand from the electric vehicles? Well, one thing about the grid is you have to build it for the peak demand, not the average demand. The peak demand is actually more than 40% greater than the average demand. So you could say there's a lot of off peak, there's a lot of unused grid capacity that we couldn't use to charge those cars and even charge the full 40%, which is the, the, the high rate estimate of what's needed. There's a problem with that argument. And the problem is that all that off peak capacity is gas, natural gas fired peaker plants. So if you charge your car off peak with that excess capacity, you're charging it with fossil electricity. You're driving your no emissions car on high emissions electricity, and that just doesn't make sense. So there needs to be some kind of managed charging. One thing that people have talked about is a strict rule. You can only charge a battery with uh, renewable electricity. You cannot charge it with fossil electricity. Don't have that rule now. But that would be a big step forward in pushing renewable. So interesting about what may happen. Uh, because, so wind, solar storage, and transmission. So how would you balance those things? And in order to get an idea, let's take a look at this graph. This came out from Bloomberg. Uh, was late last spring or early summer. They looked at the levelized cost of electricity from solar panels, that's the yellow, from on onshore and offshore wind, that's the blue, and they projected back what would have been the levelized cost of electricity from a battery, including the cost of charging the battery. So what does levelized cost mean? So for a solar panel, it means the cost of buying the panel, the cost of maintaining the panel over its lifetime, divided by the cost, uh, divided by uh, the uh, amount of electricity that it produces over its life. So uh, you can do that for wind turbines, you can do that for uh, PV, you can also do it for batteries, including the cost of charging the battery. And you see remarkably, it has fallen very much faster than even solar panels. And solar panels are kind of the poster child of falling prices, probably fell by 70 to 80 percent since uh, 2009. Uh, but you notice something. So here we are here. The cost of electricity from a battery is still maybe three or four times the cost of producing that electricity from wind or solar. 
So with that economics, you might say, oh, I'll overbuild the wind and solar and curtail it means just waste it if I don't need it because that's cheaper than building the batteries to store it. Uh, but if you extrapolate with your eye these curves, it seems likely that sometime in the future they're going to be about comparable. And if you made your plan at that time, you would probably put in more uh, more batteries and fewer solar plants. Yeah. Is there any way to offload excessive uh, alternative energy? Because there's a problem, right, with with grids not being able to transmit too much energy, right? Yeah. So is there a way of, to offload? So that's actually the next point. I didn't talk about transmission yet. You could imagine that here in Chicago, uh, there's no sun. It's overcast. That happens two or three days in a row regularly. But somewhere in Iowa, there is sun. So why don't I build a transmission line from Iowa to here, and on sunny days in Iowa and overcast days here, I'll just pull that electricity in. And you could have, and you know, the typical weather pattern is maybe 100 miles wide or 200 miles wide. So you're gonna have to build a transmission line that maybe is twice that in order to get outside the weather zones. And transmission lines are pretty expensive. Are they more expensive than building a battery or, a sol or more solar panels? That's a question economics folks, have, experts have to look at. But you, that's a solution too, and, and people do think about that. How, how effective does the current generation of high separate high temperature superproduction in and assisting with this transportation and storage problem? Or do we have to wait for the room temperature sheet? And so about 10 years ago, people were proposing that to have a high, uh, high temperature superconductor, no loss transmission line. And the savings, it's about 8% is the savings in transmission. About 8% of the electricity that goes through the line is wasted as heat. And indeed, at, at a certain cost, that makes sense. So far, nobody's picked up on that. But there, it was an elaborate... Uh, study to show that indeed you could do that and if you did do it here's how it would operate so it's in a sense a live idea although it hasn't i don't even think there are any, any test cases yet so uh i think i've already said this well this is maybe important so either wind or solar plus storage it's moving beyond the first adopters it's already taking place um how about electric heating of commercial and residential buildings? So this is from uh, the IBA, and indeed it shows that uh, here's, well, first of all, that's technology we have. I happen to live in an apartment building that's all electric heat that was built in the 1960s. So in, and in those days, Combat gave you a great race well, this during the tractors to the building owner to, to make it all electric climate change decarbonization, or in, in a few years, it might just be economics. So the idea is you would convert all the natural gas heating to electric. And this is popular. So uh, it's Berkeley, California. They put a ban on natural gas pipes in new buildings starting in January of one. Well, they have all. Uh, and so this is happening. Uh, but now we come to industry. Uh, and as I said before, industry uses fossil fuels in two ways, as a feedstock to make plastics and other high-value chemicals, or, and mostly, for combustion, simply to produce temperatures above 1,000 degrees C. And you can't do that with electricity. It just, it, it's, just, it's just impractical. So uh, what do you do? You've got to burn something. Well, hydrogen is something you could burn. And it's easy to produce a thousand degrees C by burning hydrogen. It's just as good as fuel and say natural gas. Um, Seventy-six percent of the hydrogen we have now comes from reforming natural gas, and as I said earlier, that produces as much carbon dioxide as if you had burned that natural gas. So that is not a decarbonization technique. Twenty-two percent comes from coal gasification. Same mm -hmm. argument. Only two percent comes from electrolysis. Electrolysis means you take uh, two electrodes, stick it in a beaker of water, 
put a voltage of greater than 1.2 volts across those two electrodes, and the water spontaneously breaks into hydrogen. But completely renewable, no carbon emissions. All it takes is electricity. And uh, if it's renewable electricity, then, you know, you're all free. So this is an idea that's been around for a long time, and maybe it would work. The problem right now is economics. Electricity costs more than the natural gas that you would uh, convert to, uh, to hydrogen. So it economically, it doesn't make sense. And less energy is required to convert the natural gas to hydrogen than to electrolyze water. So it's mostly economics. There is the opportunity here for uh, the price to come down because of economy of scale and for um, you know, what's called the experience curve or the learning curve. The more electrolyzery units <laughs> raised, the cheaper they get. And that's exactly what happened to solar panels. And we can thank China for that. They decided to get into the business and produce uh, mass production of solar panels and that got the price down. It all benefited from that. That could happen here too. Uh, and also, you could imagine that electricity from wind and solar will get cheaper. Why? There's no fuel. So that you don't have to burn natural gas or coal or anything. It just, uh, it's just technology to convert. So that gives you a lower floor for the price of electricity, renewable electricity. So here's an opportunity where we don't have the technology but we do need the R&D to decrease the cost of producing hydrogen bioelectrolysis. So that's my last slide. Here's the takeaway messages. De decarbonization of the global economy is needed to avoid the worst consequences of climate change. We all knew that. Uh, some technology exists, such as renewable electricity, electric cars, hydrogen fuel cells, and hydrogen combustion. Not all of it is practical. Policy is needed to promote the deployment of the existing technology, and R&D is needed to promote the new technology for energy storage and for electrolysis of water. We're not yet on track to achieve de decarbonization of the economy by 2015. It looks like if you extrapolate present trends, we're not going to make it. So we really need to get busy and address this problem.